Uh, in September of last year, NHGRI held a, a roundtable uh, here in Rockville, and uh, the subject was um, uh, addressing the challenges associated with uh, uh, diversity, bringing diversity samples uh, to genomics research. Vince, uh, who is the um, senior advisor to the NHGRI director on genomics and health disparities, was the organizer of that, and there was a uh, summary presented in uh, ECB. Uh, Vince is going to give you a report on the roundtable and ask for some feedback from Council about strategies for, again, increasing participation of underrepresented groups in genomics. So good afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity this afternoon to come and to, to brief you on the roundtable that we had last September, but also to share with you uh, some of the activities that are going on within the Institute related to genomics and health disparities. Um, as I uh, listen to Jen, and I know Lucia coming after me this afternoon, that really this is a, a thread of a conversation about how we are thinking as an institute about the issues of underrepresented populations in genomics research and the questions of disparities in the role that our institute and genomic science and LC research has in understanding health inequities and health disparities in our country. Uh, so I'll take you through very briefly some of the activities going on within our institute around genomics and health disparities uh, and then talk to you uh, about the recommendations from the roundtable and really look to the council to have a, a conversation about priorities uh, and opportunities for uh, NHGRI. So um, as, as stated by Rudy, um, I shifted roles this last year uh, and one of my major uh, responsibilities is to advise uh, Dr. Green uh, and the senior leadership around issues of genomics and health disparities and to help us in moving forward the conversations and thinking about the research portfolio and what we should be doing in this area. Uh, and part of that is actually through data collection, uh, collecting data with regards to uh, the various uh, portfolios that we have with regards to research today, both in the intramural program and in the extramural program to use for strategic planning and to help to guide uh, senior leadership in thinking about these issues and the responsibility of our institute. Uh, we also have an obligation as part of NIH to report on what we are doing around minority health and health disparities and to lead those efforts uh, for our institute in reporting at the NIH-wide level. Um, but one of the, I think one of the most important parts of my job is um, talking to other institutes and other federal agencies and seeking to build um, stronger collaborations around health disparities, uh, health inequities research uh, related to genomics uh, with other institutes in other parts of the government. And finally, to actually do some education and outreach efforts here at NIH uh, as we help to support and facilitate these activities um, throughout um, the, the scientific community. Uh, one of the efforts that we're doing here uh, at the National Institutes of Health in collaboration uh, with uh, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, NHLBI, NIDDK, uh, the FDA Office of Minority Health is to sponsor a lecture series on genomics and health disparities. This is primarily for staff here at NIH and the trainees here at NIH, but it is videotaped and will be online so that it can be used by the scientific community. And you see here we have three lectures coming up this, uh, this 2016 year, uh, and we are now planning for 2017. We would love advice from council about potential speakers and dealing with a broad range of topic areas and disciplines of importance and relevance to genomics and health disparities. And again, this will be online and be available on both in teaching settings that you may have uh, as well as to be used uh, within uh, other types of areas of importance to your work. So my primary focus here today is to talk about the roundtable. Uh, and the roundtable occurred on September 16th, as stated. Uh, and I want to start by just acknowledging that we had two council members uh, in attendance, uh, Dr. Uh, Halbert Hughes, uh, Hughes Halbert, uh, and Dr. Borwinkle. Uh, as well as a number of extramural experts that we brought in to participate in that meeting. But we also had many program staff 
uh, from across the Institute uh, involved in the meeting, attending, observing, watching. And we had six other institutes uh, attending and participating in the meeting. Again, this building stronger collaborations across NIH around the fields and questions of importance of inclusion of underrepresented populations in genomics research. So what were the roundtable's objectives? Uh, the first objective was to bring together uh, genomic scientists and health disparities researchers who actively are involved in working with populations that are underrepresented in genomics. So we really wanted to bring people from different disciplines but have been involved in actual research and activities so that they could bring their voice and perspective from their work, um, but also to have the opportunity to have this kind of really exchange from a different uh, disciplinary scientific perspective. Uh, and to discuss the scientific problems brought about by the lack of diverse ancestral populations in genomics research. And I want to stop for a second and say that this roundtable was focused on that question. How do we increase the um, diversity of ancestral populations in genomics research? We're talking today about both issues of disparity populations, but we're also talking about when we think about more broadly genomic science, the need to have more diverse ancestral populations. And we just heard from Jen about some of the exciting things that have happened with H3Africa. And so that was the focus of the meeting. We all know the, the problem that we have, that the primarily the populations in our research uh, to date have been European populations, and how do we shift that to really have it reflective of the world and the genetic variation that we know exists across the globe. Uh, the third objective was to identify existing barriers that limit underrepresented populations from participating in genomics research and strategies to address those barriers. So to identify both barriers and strategies for success. And then finally, to identify opportunities to study health disparities and health inequities in genomic science and LC research. So now let me just frame and provide you the recommendations that came from uh, the participants in the roundtable. Uh, I'm going to walk through these. There are five areas. But I'm really looking forward to the conversation we have after uh, I present the recommendations. So the first area is for NHGRI to provide leadership for the field of genomics in promoting health disparities research using genomic methods. This was a broad theme that was presented by the participants in the roundtable that we were in a unique place to really take leadership in helping to move forward both what happens here at NIH and more broadly in the genomic science community. So specific um, recommendations related to that was support the formation of interdisciplinary centers of excellence in genomics and health disparities. Uh, and this would potentially could be in collaboration with other institutes. Uh, promote genomics research that incorporates social and environmental exposures. This was a major theme about the importance of uh, studying um, in a robust way uh, social and environmental measures. Uh, conduct geno genomic studies of underrepresented populations that are inclusive of translational and implementation research, and convene conversations and meetings to explore opportunities to collaborate in areas of genomics and health disparities. Second area, examine institutional factors that impede greater inclusion of underrepresented populations in genomics research. And this issue of institutional factors really came up as an issue that at, there are times when, because of institutional factors, we're not able to have the best research funded uh, and the need to address that issue. And so one area was to assure that study sections have the expertise to evaluate applications studying underrepresented populations in genomics research so that we making sure that the members of the study section have the ability to really analyze the, the applications that they're reviewing. Uh, enhance review criteria to evaluate inclusion of underrepresented populations in the application review process. One of the issues was raised that the timing in the review, that it's really part of the, the secondary review to make sure that certain things are addressed by the application versus a study of the scientific merit. Uh, and recognize the greater exposure and of longer term 
recruitment timelines and for certain underrepresented populations. This issue that sometimes it takes longer to recruit, um, the building the relationships with communities, the cost may be different, uh, and that that's an important issue to recognize uh, up front. The third area is to promote the incorporation of environmental data into genomic studies. Again, that theme was a major theme of incorporating environmental uh, variables uh, and strategies to come up with that. So this, this question about how do we look at multifactorial uh, determinants of health and how is that really integrated within the genomics research that our institute funds and we collaborate with other institutes. Fourth area, to promote comprehensive strategies for analysis of existing biospecimens from underrepresented populations. Uh, to incentivize processing and analysis of existing sample collections from ancestrally underrepresented populations. Uh, uh, the, the concern was that, you know, there's been a lot of uh, recruitment and there are samples out there. Um, should we as an institute and should we with other institutes seek to get people to go back and really focus in and target on those populations that are, are already in the, um, the the data sharing available uh, genomic uh, 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 different websites that we have access to the data, uh, sequencing data. Uh, support the creation of new analysis methods uh, and localized centers of expertise to analyze those samples. Uh, this was an issue about that the need for methods, that we, we have some unique needs for methods that we need to think about. Um, diverse ancestral populations, and this was articulated in a way that there's really this opportunity and need to be able to understand uh, and to do the analysis. And so methods development is also an important area of focus. And to lead the development of a national genomics resource of diverse populations so that we take on some responsibility to say that we actually need to very much have uh, diverse population samples that are available for the broader community. The final area of recommendations was to support sustained community engagement and community-based participatory research, uh, to stimulate dialogues, to hear community perspectives, um, that this is an important component of the ability to work with diverse populations within the United States, um, to build long-term relationships with communities, including capacity to receive and respond to community feedback. This question of how do you build an un, a long-term, ongoing relationship with communities? How can we actually, as an institute, to help to do this uh, with it more within genomics research? Uh, clearly, it's an area that has been of importance to our LC program, um, but can we expand what we're doing around community-based uh, research? And study recruitment and recruitment methods in new and existing grants. Uh, in the portfolio. So this getting back to the issue of strategies to address the problem of, of lack of diversity and uh, of diverse ancestral populations, that if we study recruitment issues uh, as part of our portfolio of research. So in summary, I want to just highlight um, some of the recommendations that I just articulated that were common themes that we heard during the roundtable. Uh, NHGRI needs to provide leadership in framing disparities research, including baseline commitment to diversity of cohort participants and reduced cohorts of convenience. Uh, application review criteria should include formal scientific consideration of inclusion of underrepresented groups, uh, support the creation of methods to analyze diverse samples, and to recognize the need for flexible timelines needed to engage a diverse population. Um, so we're moving forward. I think you're hearing and you're seeing that we're moving forward in this area. But we really want your input. And we want your specific advice of opportunities to prioritize, recognizing that there's limited resources and we're not going to be able to do all the things that we could do to actually um, enhance the inclusion of underrepresented populations as well as issues around more inequity and disparities research. So we know that we can't do everything. So where's the greatest impact? Where are the opportunities? What would you recommend that we prioritize? We want you to help us to be more specific, um, starting today with that conversation, but coming back to you and in different uh, forums to really explore these issues. Um, but we really want guidance to help us 
uh, and you have everyone in the room kind of listening to this. Uh, and so we look forward to this conversation. I would like to ask um, Dr. Uh, Hughes Halbert and Dr. Borwinkle to start out since they were at the round table, um, but I uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Vince. Um, that was a great presentation, and I would just like to take this opportunity to congratulate you and the um, roundtable co-organizers for, um, for sponsoring and holding a, a wonderful and insightful session. It was uh, truly a great um, exchange among individuals with the diverse types of experience and expertise as it relates to um, disparities in genomics. So I had a couple of thoughts about priorities and you know, the recommendations I think look really great and are very succinct and sort of straightforward. The things that resonated with me the most, um, just thinking about the, the, the tenor of the conversation was that many of the barriers that were described by folks at the round table are long-standing barriers. I think we know about those. We, there's been a lot of data published about why people will and will not, um, people from diverse groups will and will not um, participate in genomics research and sort of the issue about these cohorts of convenience really limiting our understanding of the ways in which genomic factors um, contribute to disease risk and, and outcomes in ancestral populations, which I actually like that, that, that term. Um, so I would agree with you that I think NHGRI has an opportunity and as I see it, a lot of the, I can see the effects of the round table sort of having an impact now. Think about the CSER new concepts that are being put forth, um, I think are sort of taking this, these recommendations to heart by thinking about issues related to diversity and inclusion in a very real and concrete and substantive way. Um, you know, I think, so I, I had a priority list. I think the Interdisciplinary Centers for Genomics and Disparities is, is really an important place to start. Um, and I was going to say that would be my top priority, but as I was listening to your comments about the limited resources, it strikes me that there's a wealth of knowledge and data that perhaps haven't been mined sufficiently to understand um, some of the, to address some of the issues that you've talked about. And so thinking about my work, Gail's work, everyone's work in here has some, I think some um, touches disparities in some meaningful way. And it might be worth trying to figure out how to mine that data to identify um, ways to address some of the issues that you raise. And as I'm talking, I'm sort of losing my train of thought because I'm kind of changing it at once. But um, that's sort of maybe where I would start in terms of priorities, sort of leveraging existing data and existing um, resources to really try to think about, well, how can we engage populations um, from the perspective of, identifying what their concerns and priorities are. I would think that there's been a lot of work that has been done to understand barriers and facilitators to participating in genomics research. And if you think about, well, we wouldn't, if one theme that's consistent across studies might be that um, folks aren't interested in the disease, they don't understand genomics. And so that could be a way of sort of thinking about community priorities um, and identifying community priorities without sort of funding a special initiative. So that might be an important place to start. Um, I do think that, um, yeah, I'm gonna stop there and give someone else an opportunity to talk. Sure, so Vince, first, thanks for your leadership and pulling this together. I, I certainly appreciate it and many other people do. I really like the meeting and the outcome for, I'd say, three reasons. One is we didn't get drawn in as we often do into sort of cliches and platitudes. We, we really stuck, I think, to, to the mission of what we're going to do about it. And I thought that was import, very important for the outcome of this meeting. Then second is it's, you know, one of those cliches that we, we can get drawn into very quickly is sort of political correctness in this, this area. And, and what we did is I think we outlined good, sound scientific reasons to promote diversity in large-scale genomics research. And the two that come to mind are just the, the site fre frequency spectrum is very different among ancestral populations. And so, so those that ignore diversity um, really are going to do it at their own peril. 
because many of these rare variants are population specific and there's a there's an element of chance in this area that a scientist probably makes us a little queasy but one way to remove that element of chance is to have diversity in our, in our sample set and the second is um, is gene environment interaction you know we we, um, we we give so much lip service to gene environment interaction but very few people roll up their sleeves and try to attempt to address it in a, in a translational setting and that's again um, a reason to um, that this meeting I thought was special then the third and a related reason is um, we did not limit ourselves. In fact, maybe the pendulum swung a little too far in our, in our sort of euphoria. We didn't limit ourselves to uh, skin color and ancestral diversity. We, we spent a lot of time thinking about the, the whole spectrum of diversity that influences health and disease, economic diversity, the social setting, and on and on and on, and the impact of that. And I thought that was a very important outcome for this meeting. And then, sorry, that turned into a speech. But then coming back to sort of your list of recommendations, I, I probably would still stay with the specialized centers um, to, to promote, even though it would cost um, money to do so. But I, I think to, to address some of the scientific issues, um, I really think it's going to, you know, they can be virtual centers, if you will, um, speaking of cliches. But they can be, you know, they don't need to be in a single geographic location, but, but a coordinated network of individuals addressing some of the, the, the um, scientific uh, challenges to be brought forward. And I, I think that would work and make a little bit of progress in this area. And, and, and I, I said a little bit of progress on purpose because going back, I think NHGRI is in a, a not a unique, but a special position that really I think we can, we can actually, you know, serve as a, as a hub or as a core for the other um, institutes in, 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 again, promoting scientific ways of, of addressing um, health disparities uh, through inclusion of, of diverse populations and peoples. Thank you. Yeah, so, Eric, you spoke earlier today about $130 million for the Precision Medicine Initiative that will collect uh, samples of chronic health records in physical exam measurement. And uh, my understanding is by July of 2017, there will be 100,000 of those available. So I would just um, think that it would make more sense to think prospectively to do that than to go back to um, old collections. So this doesn't get as comprehensive as uh, what Eric just uh, described for you know taking a look at, at diversity from a, a more uh, comprehensive perspective. But I, I was struck by the uh, previous uh, speaker, and I just wonder whether maybe dealing with at least a part of the underrepresented populations, the ancestral populations of Africa, that the H3 Africa program could be folded in to this initiative to at least address part of the underrepresented population in, in this country with, with the African Americans. I, I guess my only reaction and comment I would make is that going back to this issue of data collection and as we monitor kind of what is the ancestral diversity of the populations that are available in the open databases, um, that's something that we clearly can do. And that will help us understand that. Um, so as a recognition of that question of kind of are we enhancing the inclusion of those populations that are left out. And so there's synergy, I guess, is what I'm saying. Right. And to clarify, I mean, the H3 Africa program is not ours. It's the common funds. We lead on, we donate money to it. But, you know, it's not ours to amalgamate with one of ours. But certainly to synergize with it, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, and, and leverage those resources. Exactly. Yeah. All right, Gail, then Jim, and then Peter. Yeah, um, well, Vince, you, you know I, I, we just saw each other at another meeting that was um, dealt with a lot of these same topics, and I think you're, this is a very good presentation, very good to spark conversation. I want to just say first I, com I really support what Janita said um, about the fact that we, there's a ton of data, a ton of information already about the ways that 
social and environmental factors that are uh, related to race and ethnicity and other um, vulnerable populations identified through socioeconomic status, through you know remote geographic areas, et cetera. We know a lot about barriers to access to health care, and we know a lot about um, the ways that, you know, that sort of the causes of health disparities in the United States, you know, that are very linked to treatment of individuals um, through racism, through and mistrust of research. I mean, we have done that, okay? We've also really had the conversation about the fact that um, that the oh, that the um, OMB categories for race that we all have to report and ethnicity that we all have to report whenever we get a grant, that those are very uh, inaccurate measures of a biological um, phenomenon, but much more socially constructed. We, we've had that conversation. We, we know that. So, so one thing that I really want to strongly recommend here is that we, we work very hard to not mix up a discussion of disparities with a discussion of the contribution of ancestral populations to um, health outcomes, to uh, risk for disease, to, um, well, to risk for disease. So um, I, I also really like having a new term because the minute we start using terms for diverse populations that we're using for other reasons and other contexts, to actually represent other um, um, determinants, or we, we get lost. I mean, we just always do. And then we dig our way out and we say, oh, well, really, you know, we know it's very complicated. We know these things are measuring different things. But what are we going to use? Um, for ancestral populations, we often use race and ethnicity because we, if we're going to do a survey or we're going to do recruitment, how do we decide who to include, right? We don't have their genetic data already to um, to sample from. So what do we do? And then so we sort of fall back on that. And we hope for the best, but it's a but then we're already mixing things up. It's already not the best way to recruit people if we're thinking about ancestry populations, and it muddies the water about causation. So I would say that a wonderful, this is a wonderful opportunity for NSGRI to take a lead in really thinking about what is a good way to measure ancestry populations um, to be a proxy for it in some way that when you say you're going to do inclusion of people that need to be included in genomics, not in environment. Environment, you know, we can think a whole lot about um, you know, factors that are related to um, environmental exposures that are related to socioeconomic status, that are related to discrimination. But this is only about genomics. If we really focus on genomics, and then we, we just have this amazing opportunity to say, you know, we haven't been thinking about this clearly. It really needs to be differentiated. It's really tough to come up with a way to do this. In fact, it's, it's probably impossible. We probably need to do it in ongoing studies where we recruit people, and then we test them, and then we say, well, how close are we? If we use some proxy, how close are we? Well, we're not very close. Well, then how could we get closer? You, anyway, let me. this is sort of a soapbox that I'm on. But, but I think that it's just a moment where we can say, we're not thinking about this clearly. We really need to think about it more clearly if we're going to talk about inclusion. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So um, I, I, we were all charged with trying to come up with some very specific types of, of actions that we could make to increase minority participation. So it, just, just trying to run down a list of the things mm -hmm. that I thought would be most helpful. Um, one is that, that there, I, I loved your presentation. I wish I could have been at the, at the meeting. One of your bullets said study recruitment and recruitment method. As I mentioned in closed session, I think one of the really critical things we have to do is not just study recruitment. We have to study the whole cascade and retention. And, and although that sounds kind of platitudinous, it, it, it really stunned me when we looked at our own enrollment cascade. We've done pretty well in our CSER project of really targeting minority involvement. But if you look at the enrollment cascade, what you see is a, a disproportionate loss of African Americans, for example. 
And as, as Gail, I said this in the closed session, but I think it's really important, as Gail has said to me, you know, if you look at this enrollment cascade, you end up, you, you select these people and then you get a subset of those people and a subset of those people. At the end of the study, you've got a tiny subset of people and you're trying to make general, general conclusions and that's kind of false. So, to, to cut to the chase, I think it's critical. One of the things NHGRI can do is to demand um, some reflection of what that, that retention and study cascade looks like in studies. That isn't particularly expensive. I think that one has to um, ask for very detailed plan and concrete plans of how grantees are going to accomplish these things. And these can, you know, we have found it working with clinics that have minor, high minority populations, funding transportation, um, integrating with the, the subject's clinical activities because they're much more likely to go to their clinic visits than they are to an add-on um, research uh, type of visit. Um, having language resources, uh, obtaining backup contact information on everyone. These are populations where you can't get a hold of people at a disproportionate rate. So those are fairly simple things that can be asked about. Um, I think that you can ask grantees to um, lay out a plan for how they're going to engage the community and the, the subject um, because we've found that, you know, as, as it's not new to anybody who's looked at the literature on this, trust is an issue, right? So besides very tangible things like I can't afford gas to get there and, and we really see an increase in enrollment if you give gas money, um, trying to find ways to increase trust, although more difficult, is still doable. Engaging the community, newsletters, uh, working with clinics that have already gained their trust because they take care of them. Um, I think a really briefly, that issue of how to define the minorities is really important. I, again, would urge you to go back again and again to um, groups that have had disparities. And I agree with Gail, you can't conflate right disparities with, with this, but you do need to use that as the touchstone, I think, for deciding what groups you're going to target. Um, otherwise, it becomes kind of an exercise in, in nonsense. Um, and as far as highest priority, I, I guess I would just say um, focus on strategies for looking at the entire lifetime of the study and how grantees do with um, retaining individuals, not, not just recruiting. So I'll stop there. Thank you. So listening, listening to the discussion made me think of a question about, you know, this idea of an interdisciplinary center for genomics and disparities, which in some ways, you could think, I would think of that as being implemented as a, um, you know, one-time solicitation for, you know, to establish these centers versus um, thinking more um, programmatically in terms of creating a program in NHGRI that focused on the issue of disparities in genomics. And then that center, that program provides the infrastructure for addressing all of the recommendations that are that was that was developed through this um, workshop because it was broader than inclusion. I think. I mean, some of it was, you know, patient engagement is important, but it's not just important for getting to, to recruiting and retaining individuals in studies. It's an issue about you know defining the research agen agenda. And so, I don't know the rules and regulations for you know creating another programmatic entity within an NIH center, but. That may be one option to think about because it, it would give the infrastructure to address a, um, you know address all of these issues in an empirical scientific way rather than trying to figure out how to integrate um, as the only strategy. I think integration is important and sort of sort of having a broad impact, but I also think if it's too diffuse and not coordinated in a sufficient way, then it becomes too diffuse and meaningful. Not, you can't see its impact. So I don't know what the, I guess I have a question and a comment. And now my question is, is it possible to create a different organizational program or? I guess what do you mean by an organizational pro, you, you mean another program in the next mural pro, you know, yes. as part of our portfolio? Yes. Well, we do that all the time. Okay. We could, and for instance, we need to be budget for it, for sure. Okay. But, but, is, you, but that's a, 
that's not something that we do within the government. You know, okay. You're, you're, I mean, you're saying organizational, so I'm just wanting to make sure I'm you don't mean. Organi in my mind, organization is NHGRI. So, so what I'm thinking about, my parallel is in a cancer center, there are different programs that address different scientific issues. And the way I sort of make that um, relationship to NHGRI is that there's Genomic Society, there's the other program. So I might be con conflating all of these. But when you say program, do you mean something that we'd be physically doing with government staff, or do you mean a program we'd be, you know, a granting program we'd couple together as some set of funds to do something where we'd be um, I think a granting program yeah. is what, okay. I, what I'm thinking of. Uh, Val and then Lon. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, David's uh, comment earlier about it makes sense it's, uh, to go back to the ancestral sites, if you want, uh, ancestral populations regarding H3 Africa. However, uh, <coughs> you have to be careful there because one thing that H3 Africa and other uh, uh, international groups I've been involved with, uh, they don't want you exploiting their population. They want to do the work within their own uh, countries, and that's become much more uh, prevalent uh, now than it used to be 20 years ago when I started working with outside populations. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't know if it can be done or not. But Then the other thing I, I want to comment on, I'm very interested in uh, Eric's uh, great comments. Uh, about diversity, including environmental diversity. And I just wondered how much uh, that was really discussed at this meeting. Uh, <clears throat> coming from Iowa, there's two things I can't get away from. One is presidential politics. The, uh, <laughs> yeah, done. The, the, the other is uh, farming. Uh, so we do have a lot of uh, rural population that have sort of unique exposures or somewhat unique exposures. And uh, I think you have to balance going to an environmental different population with that going with ancestral. Uh, uh, this would hurt me research-wise, but I, I think the emphasis would uh, tend to be, would should be balanced toward the side of ancestral. Yeah, maybe it's more of a uh, question of clarification for you, Vince, but yeah. also Eric, because it's kind of in your area, my question is, and it relates um, to some, something you had specifically on your slides, but also that I think Dale and Jim came to, and it's this analysis methods or reuse of the data that we've got. I mean, it makes perfect sense to extract every ounce of information we can from the data that have been collected because they're so difficult to collect and costly and so on. On the other hand, there's an old adage that's paraphrased that uh, you know, to ask someone to do and construct an analytical methods after the data are collected is to do a post-mortem. And so is it, the st how much can we get from the data that we've got versus just collecting the right data yeah. now? Like Dr. Barman can start. Well, first, I don't see them as mutually exclusive. I, I think first we should make sure we're analyzing slash mining the data we have with this discussion in, in, in mind. Typically, people have other questions. They're, they're looking at the data. They're not looking at the data with a particular eye in terms of either, um, you know, health disparities, number one, or issues of, of recruitment and retention. There's a lot of experience in the epidemiologic community on, on recruitment and, reten and, and retention of, of, of different groups of people. Um, most people, to be honest with you, don't see it as, um, quote, science. And so a lot of it's probably not published. Um, you know, the stories that Jim just talked about, there's, there's just a lot of experience out there, and we, we probably need to get it up and get it out. And then the second, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, there's probably nothing worse than, you know, sort of backing into the question. Um, so if we can articulate a clear agenda, I, I do think it's important that we, we do launch new initiatives in this area. So, again, I'm repeating myself. I don't see the two as mutually exclusive, and they, they both should be undertaken. And, and I guess the one comment I want to make is that one of the issues that came out during the meeting was this around methods. 
and thinking about the issues of, of variants that are not known in certain populations. Are, are there new methods that we could develop to better utilize and, and take care of the samples we already have? And I, you know, the person I'm remembering who was talking about this was a basic scientist who was thinking about this question of that we need to have some different approaches to address these issues. So just to the last question under the discussion point, what what would we like NHGRI reports on efforts uh, to include underrepresented populations? Um, so I think in the past we have had such reports about the success of of recruiting underrepresented groups in genomics. You get an yeah, annual summary, an annual but summary. that's just a snapshot of what's gone on. It's yeah. not targeted in any way. Yeah, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I think in addition to that, I don't think that report uh, addressed Jim's issue about retention. It was really who was recruited, but not about the attrition rate. And and I think that would be really good to include in these reports, um, maybe even along with the information on the kinds of things like our gas cards provided, our thing, so that we can really start to break down what factors are the most impactful in retaining uh, the recruits in the studies. I think that would be useful. I don't think we've had that kind of report before. So I would like to see that. Um, and then the, just the second quick point is that, um, again, to something we talked about in the closed session, I think one of the best ways to continue to be more successful in recruiting is to have the genomics research community also be more diverse. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of ways to go uh, in that uh, that realm, and certainly the diversity action plan, all those training programs, we have to continually push and maybe even expand the efforts in, in, in that, because I think that in the long run will have a huge impact on our ability to engage these different uh, communities. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to close by um, saying that there were a lot of people involved in helping to make the roundtable a success. Uh, but I really want to um, identify the individuals on this slide, but really all the, uh, the, the staff in the, the Genome Institute that were involved and listened and were part of the process of helping to identify the individuals uh, to invite to the meeting. So I just want to um, thank my colleagues at the Institute and uh, my colleagues at other institutes that participated in the meeting.